Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Chris. Uh, so good afternoon, everybody. Um, yeah, it is my uh, great pleasure to be here and with uh, Chris uh, so, and everybody here. So, uh, so my English is not so enough to you know discuss this kind of things, but I'm trying. So I, I, I will try, and Chris will help me. Out. So yes, well, enjoy. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to read uh, the four or five pages of uh, Your Republic is Calling You, my uh, the fourth novel. And this story is about so, a North Korean, North Korean spy who lives in Seoul. So, uh, this novel is set in Seoul, so I think it's, it's very you know, special experience for me. So to read this novel in Seoul, in English. So, this is my first experience, so yes, I'm going to read it. Uh, Kian Pit tends to drop his ticket on the ground and glances quickly behind him. He feels his gut fold over his belt as he bends down. Once upon a time, he boasted of how to physic with hard muscles, envied by members of the combat team. The very fact that he spent time with the combat agents, professional assassins who specialized in infiltration and escape, meant he was in good shape. But that was a long time ago. He is becoming an average middle-aged South Korean man. His belly wound, his chest peeling, and his arms jiggling. The people relax when they look at his belly. They assume that someone like him can't be a mother. It's safest to be a man who is uninteresting, neither too old nor young. Someone living a, living a settled life. The kind of man who supports his family but is ignored by them. These ordinary men sometimes take part in risky transactions when the opportunity present itself, their hearts racing, trying to believe they're, they are safe because everyone does it. They can become mired in a bog of corruption, perhaps in the form of kickbacks, bribery, or slush funds, and they don't foolishly dream that they can wait out of it. Nothing has changed since their college days when they the clandestinely studied Kim Il-sung's Juche idea. Some men say that being involved in politics is like balancing on prison walls, morally precarious. But Kion believes that this is the common fate of all men, those men who were once bewitched by illegal ideology in college, are probably leading the same mundane life as Kion. They would have realized the harsh that is capitalism and quickly given their own to the world in which they were born. Wading through the most dangerous moment of his life, Kion knows nothing other than that an order was issued. I want to know more. I want to know more. I want to know more. Kion thirsts to know not what is going on, but whether he is the only target. He needs to know whether the others are aware of what is going on. Why was he given order for? Was his identity revealed or did he inadvertently leak something? The two possibilities sound like the same thing, but they are actually very different. If it is the former, the authorities are recalling him for his protection. The latter, to punish him, but there is no way to know which it is until he returns. During the Cold War, the KGB had overseas spies returned to Moscow under the pretext of holding an important discussion, then killed them. A bonus waited for the Moors who aided the enemy. The shamed spies were slowly slid into the smelter's melting iron, surrounded by their colleagues. 
like the Terminator. Of course, sometimes there really was a discussion and afterward they would be sent back out again. I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know what thing. Kiyong has no idea what is happening. He has been living as a forgotten spy since Lee sang hyuk was purged. As he hasn't engaged in very many activities, there hasn't been much chance to be discovered. But you never know. It is possible that he unwittingly made a fatal error, or it could always be a misunderstanding. Anyway, he has less than a day. He has to find something out, anything, before the deadline. There has to be a clue somewhere. I'm sure there was some kind of sign, but I just didn't notice it. What happened to me in the past few days? Was there an old phone call or a stranger following me? If there had been, wouldn't I have noticed it? No. His senses could have been dulled because he's been living complacently for so long. By now, he is standing on the subway platform. He hears the announcement that the train is about to arrive. He draws in a deep breath, inhaling it all, like he is going to cherish his scents forever. Minute dirt particles, the smell of car lubricant, liquor on the breath of an old drunk, the perfume of a young sexy woman. He holds his breath, then exhales slowly through his nose. Right then, the subway train rattles past him and slows. The people on the platform wait patiently for the doors to open, standing docilely on the footprints on the floor, past it behind the yellow line to encourage queuing. Will I have to go back? Will I be safe if I go? Will I even be able to decide whether to go or not? Why would I go back? No, I can't. I can't. I can't go back. He places a hand on his forehead and steps back. The doors open and the people wash out of the car and the quicker ones push in and find the seats. Kiyong continues to waver as he takes in the seat inside the car. The announcement that the car will leave soon. The automatic door vibrating, impatient and ready to shut at any moment. The black-headed conductor sticking his head out to check out the platform. The provocative jeans head on the side of the car. The mother's sexy ass sticking out like a dog's. The seagull-shaped stitching on the pocket emphasizing the curve of her behind. The dirty floor covered in a black splotches of sped out chewing gum. The calm gazes of a passenger sitting inside. He can't decide whether to get on or not. Finally, the car doors bang shut as if yelling, get out of here. He feels as if a door were slammed in his face or as if his innermost secrets had been revealed. The people sitting in the subway car leaving the station look at him as if they could see the dark, murky waters churning in his heart. They smile conspirate um, <laughs> conspiratorially and look back at him standing immobile on the platform. As all, know your place, act your age and status. We all learn what we can and can't do under this system. Don't you know it's a crime not to follow those rules? Go back to the empire of strong red paint strokes, the country where children blowing on their frozen hands to keep them warm, turn their cars in unison to create an ever-changing backdrop in the stadium during the mass games, where people scorn women for wearing jeans. Your Republic is calling you. Everyone seems to be yelling at him from inside the subway car. Their hands cupped around their mouths. His, he imagines plugging his ears with his hands, but that wouldn't draw anything out. The subway car, headed toward Bong Hwa San, leaves behind a sharp metallic switch. 
as if refusing to hear Kian's reply and resolutely disappears into the dark tunnel. Not all of the uh, Kiyon Ha's novels have been published in English yet, at, but they are in the process of being translated. But this is one of them um, that we're lucky to have. His uh, most recent uh, translated novel is this one here, Black Flower, which was out uh, just uh, a few, uh, about five, six months ago. Um, so uh, I want to start with a very basic question, um, as some of us might know and others might not. Um, how you came to be a writer. I became especially curious about this after I heard your TED talk, um, an excellent TED talk uh, called uh, uh, Be an Artist Now. Uh, so when I was young, so I lived in the near the DMZ area so because my father was a army officer. So uh, and my my parents wanted me to be a kind of you know businessman or accountant, you know, so who you know is able to make to make money and a stable you know job. So, but uh, so uh, I entered into the UNC University, and my major uh, is. Um, Business of administration. So, uh, in Korea, we call this kind of act Kyodo. I wanted, I, I wanted to be a good son so, to my parents, but that is my last good act to <laughs> my parents. So I, I didn't study at all. So, yeah. so and business of administration and some. And then the, the subjects of the major was were really boring, and so I need some kind of you know an exit in this case. So I I, I wrote some uh, the short fiction so, uh, on the net. So I found some audience. So I found some audience. They I uh, said to me so they liked my story so they you know encouraged me so why don't you you know write some you know the longer things so yeah, yeah so I just began to write and began to study began to read you know serious fictions and uh, good pieces of uh, you know fictions so yeah, that, that is my beginning it's a very interesting TED talk, if you haven't heard that, quite inspiring. Um, and uh, Young Ha was just telling me in the back that uh, after this uh, talk uh, was put up, um, he's been getting uh, lots of mail uh, from both people in Korea as well as all around the world saying, I've started painting again after you know, stopping for decades, or I've started to write. You know, this, I think that's very exciting when you can start you know, momentum for someone else that way. Uh, Black Flower uh, strikes me as a radical departure from anything you've written before in the its narrative telling and especially the montage of characters um, and also the pacing as well. Um, I was wondering, how did you come to this idea and what did this novel mean to you personally? Uh, so Black Flower is my third novel and uh, before, before this novel, so I didn't write a historical fiction. So, so back then, so my audience uh, so told me, uh, oh, we didn't expect uh, you, you know, write uh, this historical fiction. So and, uh, that was as there was as as a friend of mine. Yes, uh, he's a the film director, and uh, he flew uh, to Seoul from Los Angeles, and. The, on the plane, on the flight, on the flight, uh, he uh, met an, met an you know, uh, scholar next to sit to him. So 
the scholar told him a very interesting, intriguing story. So he uh, was studying the Korean immigration history. So he told the, to my friend, he told my friend, so uh, <laughs> enjoy it. <laughs> yeah. So in 1905, so 1,000 and more the Korean the people moved to Mexico, and they uh, you know worked at the haciendas, the plantations, Mexican plantation in the Yucatan Peninsula, but they they were not able to return to Korea because uh, Korea was uh, uh, was occupied by Japan and uh, you know, the nation was disappeared. So, uh, and 1910, the Mexican Revolution uh, began. So, so, in that chaos, they, some of them moved to the northern Guatemala and they built a small nation in the jungle. So, so new Korea, kind of so new Korea. So, uh, that is very, you know, so fantastic story. So, but he didn't buy that new stone because uh, it sounded so too, you know, fantastic, uh, too, you know, so too great. So, but uh, but I did some research so in the, the library, so I found some clues. So that story could be um, the true story. So I, you know, so I, I flew to Mexico and Yucatan Peninsula and Guatemala, and I began to write the first chapter of the Black Flower in uh, so Antigua, Antigua in Guatemala. So, it's funny. I, I, I do recall um, one of the questions that I had wanted to ask was about this itinerant lifestyle of your source. Um, I, I met uh, uh, Ha last year when my book came out at a meeting in uh, New York City. And uh, we, we had a meal together, and I, I could never forget what uh, he had said to me at that time. He looked at me and he said, you're now a writer, but a professional writer, you will be lonely. <laughs> and I thought, oh gosh. <laughs> It's been two weeks since I started. I learned I'll be lonely for the rest of my life. What does this mean? And um, I, I learned in the last year and a half what that, in some ways, that means or that entails as you're traveling all around the world or jumping around. And I've spent very little time in school um, for that reason. And um, it, uh, I, I wonder what is that like for you? Because you spent so much of your time overseas, and even when you're here, you're on the move all the time. Um, how has that uh, both uh, changed your work and, and your life? Loneliness, because I, I see that in your work. Solitude is a, is a preoccupation. Yes, uh, yeah, I remember the, 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 the face of Chris uh, when I you know, <laughs> told the, the secret to Chris, you will be lonely. And uh, so, you know, yes, yeah, so I, I want you to, you know, Cheer her off, but, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, yeah. But, but I believe, yeah, yes, uh, being a writer, so the means, uh, you know, became to become to become lonely guy, so lonely the person. So yeah, yeah. So I live in the Busan now. So there, uh, there is no friends. So <laughs> the wife, you know, the wife makes a phone call to me. So, so yeah, but, but I, you know, accept. Yeah, I accept. Not only accept, in some ways you've created it uh, by voluntarily moving to Busan. I, I think you've talked about this before too, and I found that really interesting. Yes, yes I hate yeah. people. <laughs> 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 yes, uh, but you know the. the Writer, the job of the job of the writer, a writer is uh, you know making a world, so for his uh, or her own the world. So 
I believe the writer should live uh, with them, so my characters and, uh, and in my world. So sometimes I have some, some trouble, uh, you know, living with people and uh, hang, hanging out with people. So, so, so I, I, I tell them so. Uh, I charge myself with you know kind of so like kind of battery. So social battery. Uh, uh, battery so that it uh, doesn't last uh, two hours or three hours. <laughs> so I and then I had to I had to go back to my walk, go back to my world, go back to my characters, go back to my you know, novels. So so now you see you see my uh, very socialistic ego and <laughs> so or as avatar so, of, of, of Kim Yama. So real Kim Yama is walking on his desk, so it, this is my avatar and uh, very look friendly and uh, <laughs> smiling. This is not me. Very <laughs> Actually, speaking of characters. Uh, when you speak avatar or mask, the first story I read of yours uh, was uh, Doi Uimi, uh, which was uh, um, anthologized uh, and it won the uh, Isang Munaksan, the Isang Literary Prize, I think in 2003. Yes. Um, and I was intrigued because uh, the main character is a, a sleazy playboy film director, quite comical character as well. Um, and in the first character, the main character in I Have uh, the Right to Destroy Myself, that is um, uh, in some ways uh, you know, not, it's very uh, a suspect as well. But then, then there's this other great total range and uh, personalities and backgrounds that have emerged in uh, the, the, the next 10 years of your work. That's kind of an astonishing uh, range. And, but I'm wondering, you as a writer, there's something secret there that's tying all these characters together, or there's reasons why certain characters are more interesting, and you become obsessed, and you want to live with certain characters longer than others. And what, you know, tell us something about that. What attracts you to, you know, this, these particular characters? Uh, yeah. Uh, I, I believe uh, everyone is special. So everyone is weird. So, <laughs> yeah, so everyone has some weird aspect in their mind. So their the act. So I just watch them. So uh, in 2003, uh, from uh, from 2001 to 2004, I work with uh, the the film industry. Uh, I I wrote some film scripts. And uh, I work with them, so you know, uh, so I watch them, and uh, uh, I don't know. So I don't know. What can I say? Um, yes, that people say that you know, in your novels and in your short stories, there are many characters, and there's a, a big spectrums of the characters. So I don't know how I you know pick the characters they just come to me so yeah but I really like uh, to watch people and to talk to them so uh, let me tell a story so so ten years ago so nine years ago so my the computer the desktop computer uh, was broken it's broken so uh, a computer guy so visited my so house, and uh, he and he and I so were talking about his life and his wife and his sons, and so he he so wanted to return his uh, the office. So he told the he told his boss the lie. So uh, this desktop computer. So it was uh, totally broken. So I needed more time. So yeah. So I, he and I just uh, were talking the everything of his life and how he became a uh, you know. What can I say? Uh, a repairman. A repairman and uh, so how much he loved 
love his uh, job and so uh, I, I have many experiences of, like that so when I meet a fisherman fisherman some or some repairman some the cable guys so, <laughs> and the taxi drivers so yeah so that I think so I, I have a, a few the talent of the writers but the, the one thing I, I really the one thing I really like is uh, talking and people making people talk to me so for a long time so, that is my story. I wonder how many people have lost their jobs as a result. <laughs> right. um, I, I, really, I want to talk just a bit about uh, your short story uh, called Kurinja um, Rapanshanai. The English title is The Man Who Sold uh, His Shadow. It's up on Words Without Borders, the site of uh, translations from around the world. Um, it's, it, it, we, I mentioned the word solitude before, and this is probably one of the loneliest stories I've ever read in my life. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 you know, I've, I've read it several times, actually, and each time I read it, it, it quietly, slowly breaks my heart. Um, and um, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in both the story's origins as well, but more the, the pattern of images in the story. It starts with a bird and a shadow. There's a man and woman hiding in the bushes. Uh, a man in fire. Um, there's others, I won't give the story away, I won't spoil it. Um, but I'm interested in how the images are important to you in shaping your work. I see it again in the book, um, I'm translating Kim Yong Ha's uh, latest novel. And again, I see that preoccupation with the image and how the image surprises us much later in very um, in unusual ways. Yes, uh, yeah, the story is, uh, so my my favorite short story, too. So, yeah. and, uh, and the story started from an image. So, Chris, uh, you just uh, so right. So, you know the 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 the, the LP album of Pink Floyd. Floyd. I I, I forgot the, the the name of the. Uh, what is that? Dark side of the moon. Uh, dark side of the moon. No, the guy is. Uh, you not Fire. Uh, yeah. Wish you were here. Oh uh, yeah, wish you were here. I wish you were. You wish you were here. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that's right. So, uh, when I uh, wrote the story, so I I just uh, so, so the album. So the, the album is my wife. Uh, favorite album. So she really uh, loves the, the Pink Floyd. So, yeah, so I, the story uh, started from the image. And uh, so, uh, let me tell the background of the so, my childhood so that I built that. So, I had a Catholic so, background. So, when I was born, so my mother and my father. Uh, what is that? Yongsen? Sere? Yongsen? Baptized? Yeah, baptized me. So, uh, I had, so I have a Catholic name, so my name is Antonio. No. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm a Yonha Antonio Kim. So, so my, my, my aunts and my uncles told me when I was baby, so Antonio, Antonio. So, I thought that was my name. So my family has a very strong, uh, you know, Catholic background. So when I was a uh, high school student, I wanted to be uh, the monk, uh, Francisco, Francisco, Franciscan, Franciscan monk. So uh, in summer vacation, so I would uh, visit the uh, Frances Franciscan uh, school. Monastery. Mon monastery, and I stayed there in seven days or ten days with my friends. So, uh, so some of my friends uh, so became the monk or the father, priest, priest. But uh, I was expelled by uh, some monk because uh, 
true property and <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah so so one day is so a monk uh, you know um, told me uh, brought me to his office and uh, he told me you uh, are not the kind of you know, people who can stay in the, in the, in the monastery so for your life so and uh, so I'm um, yeah, that kind of my experience, you know, I hope someday you you mm -hmm. went back to or go back to that father and say uh, he's a writer because of you. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I I, I, you I really like their the clothes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's very you know very you know comfortable, okay. comfortable <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I don't. I don't want to go back to the monastery. It's too boring. Yeah. Right. Um, we looked at, talked briefly about the stories as well as the novels. And I want to go to, back to something that Ch uh, the writer Chang Rady had once said. Uh, the writers are essentially short story writers or novelists at heart. Uh, he gave an example of the, uh, Tobias Wolf, who he said was essentially a short story writer, even though he's won prizes for his memoirs and novels. Do you consider yourself more of a story writer or a novelist? What form attracts you most? Uh, so actually, I don't agree so, uh, with this word. So, uh, writer is essentially so can be a short story writer or novelist. So, um, I don't know. I don't know much about the American tradition, but in Korea, many writers uh, do you know, write uh, short stories and the novels simultaneously. I think he means yeah. what's, what you consider your greatest strength like, at heart. What is the uh, form that's most natural to you? Uh, yeah. Actually, uh, so my audience, the Korean audience, uh, prefer my short stories. So, and uh, my short story collections uh, sells more, more than the novels. It, 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 it's not common even in Korea, but, but in my heart, so I want to be a novelist, uh, not, uh, not short story writers. So I think so writing short stories is, you know, looks like a uh, Hobby to me. So sometimes I I I, I wrote uh, my short stories just uh, so one day, one day or two days. I, I write very fast. When I write short stories, so I write it really fast. So and I you know I revise it so many many times. But the, the first draft is I really you know work fast. But when I write novels, it, it, so it totally, it's totally different. So I, you know, think about so many things, the characters and the plots, and uh, and uh, I I do research, blah blah blah. But when I write short stories, so I I I, I don't do you know research. I just uh, write uh, the fast. So. So just like uh, so the TED talk, right? right? So. Yeah. That's interesting. I said it's funny because when I think of myself, yeah. I've seen that I, I feel like I'm much more of a natural novelist, but I really wish I were a real story writer in some ways. Oh, really? and, you know, I started with a story collection, but of course everything exploded over 50 pages and then I had to throw it all away. Uh, so I think there's some kind of natural orientation that we always want to be what we're not in some ways. Um, a, talking, I want to go to translation actually, not of your work per se, but um, your uh, translation work itself. Uh, Kim Yong has actually recent, um, not well, somewhat recently, four years ago, he's translated uh, The Great Gatsby um, into Korean, and it's now number two on the bestseller list. <laughs> but, uh, the act of uh, translation, um, of course, is going, especially from Korean to English or English to Korean, transforms a work so much because you're reversing the order of 
the sentences, essentially, and reconstructing a voice and a tone and a character. Um, and when you look at your translations of your own work, uh, these, these books here, and you may have looked at parts of it, no matter how good a translator you have, you're going to see your work altered. And in what ways do you think your work has changed in the translation? What are you less satisfied with? Or how do you think your work suffers through translation? What gets lost in translation? Uh, so I, uh, in 2003, so I heard the two high school uh, boys were talking so in the bookstores. So they uh, they were talking about the Great Gatsby, so the, the Great Gatsby in Korean, the translated version. So the two high school guys were talking. Holy shit! So this novel is so boring. Like, so, so I, I was shocked, and so, uh, so I checked the translated versions of uh, the Korean versions of Great Gatsby. So I found that so the translations were not good enough to the, the high school students enjoy, and so. I, I, I didn't think the Great Gatsby is not that boring, and uh, so that is romance. That, that is the romance story, and uh, yeah. So that's why I you know so began to translate the Great Gatsby. So uh, in Korean versions, Nick and uh, Daisy at that time. So in the Korean version. So they speak in Chondemma. Mm -hmm. so how can I say in English? For formal Korean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. High register Korean? Yeah, yeah. Nick and Daisy's cousins, that they you know, speak in uh, Chondemma in Korean. And uh, so, so that kind of things, so, uh, there were that kind of things in the translations. So I tried to, so, oh, Tried to make uh, the younger version of Great Gatsby, so so I, I did it. So I finished it in two thousand and nine, uh, and luckily the Baz woman <laughs> made a film. So uh, now uh, the Great Gatsby was a uh, 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 so my Great Gatsby so is on the best seller list. So where I haven't so <laughs> get the, the, the link. So, so I haven't uh, so entered, entered into the top 10 of the best seller list in Korea. But the great gates view of my, <laughs> my translation is uh, now uh, the number two, second, or third. And the, so uh, how, how lucky I am. <laughs> but, yeah. Yeah, so, and uh, I, I think uh, the translation uh, have not changed my style. So because uh, the, the Great Gatsby is my only translation, and the story, uh, the novel is very short. Actually, I meant when uh, 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 your own books are translated, uh, do you feel as if something, if do you feel as things get lost in your own work uh, when they're translated? Uh, actually, uh, I. I, I, I don't read my translations. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. People wouldn't believe my word, but because uh, you know, I, I write in Korean, in Korean, and uh, I, I revise, revise it so again and again, so many times. So, yeah, I, I, I don't want to read my novel in English or in French or, but. So when I was in New York City, in the, in, in the United States, uh, sometimes I have to read my novel in English. So as you heard, so uh, so I uh, I did the practice to read uh, my novel in other languages like uh, English, but that's not you know common. So 
Uh, I, I just believe my editor and my translator is so that's all I can do. So uh, yes, yes, I choose a good. I try to choose. I try to be the good editor and the good translator and the good literary agent. And so I, I don't do anything so beyond the uh, the choice. So yeah. Last question, I mean, not the last question today, sorry. Uh, the last question about translation, though. Um, what do you think are some differences between a writer's and a translator, uh, a writer's approach to translation and in academics? Because they're both in the States, but particularly in Korea, uh, many academics are actually doing translations of some of the great classics as well as the contemporary literature. And I just read yesterday, the day before yesterday, I had a huge row with a very famous Korean professor who wouldn't allow me to change a word of his translation in a poem that he had both misinterpreted, uh, condensed, and used a very formal diction in, in a, a place where it didn't require that. He said, you can't touch it, not a word. <laughs> and, I, and I wonder what your experience has been when you look at all the works in Korea, they, I mean, they read so much translated literature. I wonder um, you know, what do you think of those translations done by writers like Chong Yong Moon versus uh, professors and academics?
so, um, referring back to what I had said about what gets lost in translation, um, you know, inevitably something is actually lost, and what you have in the original is this American culture, but when it's translated, what you ultimately end up with is something more resembling Korean culture by default. Victor Hugo, Victor Hugo, the French the writer, so translated in translated Shakespeare into French, but his translations were very bad. So, so there are many, there were many you know, misunderstanding of uh, the English because Victor Hugo were not was not uh, good at uh, speaking English, but French people so prefer. The Victor Hugo's Shakespeare. So they, they said, we need so we need a beautiful the French. So so that is that is that can be a, a, a kind of extreme you know extreme case. But I think that is the fate of translation. So, so every translation you know, lost lost it. I lost, uh, I lost something. Yeah, so that is the fate. Um, uh, we have to accept that most, I think. Um, as is you already know, I'm a huge fan of your pop, uh, podcast, um, and uh, there's a uh, quite a few um, moments or books in the in your podcast when you talk about uh, uh, poetry collections and how poets know how to see. You know, the power of observation. And that really, um, I, I thought about your work uh, when um, I listened to this podcast because I, I could be wrong, but I do see this growing kind of ability to see things in a different way and to describe them to make it new for us in the way that maybe your first book didn't reflect as much. And so there's this growth um, uh, there. And I'm wondering what other uh, lessons uh, or what you've learned from reading, from a life of reading, from other fiction uh, writers and poets, what do you consider the lessons you've taken? Uh, uh, so actually I was inspired by uh, the New Yorker fiction podcast. So did you, do you hear that? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah, yeah. The, that is really good, uh, the, the podcast by uh, Deborah, Deborah. Yeah, the fiction editor of uh, the New Yorker. So, uh, so I wanted to make a, so a podcast like that. So, at that time in two thousand and nine and two thousand and ten, so there was uh, so no podcast culture in Korea. So the people so say uh, so my podcast. So so might be a, so the first, you know, so podcast uh, in Korea. So uh, first good podcast, I mean, so <laughs> in Korea. <laughs> so before my podcast, uh, so almost every podcast is uh, the, you know, the, the missionary podcast by a priest and uh, blah blah blah. So yeah, but uh, I I. Got to know, so making podcast is not easy, you know. So I had to invite other the fiction writers to my home or to my office, but it's not easy to. Uh, some I have to pay something. So okay, let's read. So <laughs> by myself. So I just read the some of the novels and some of the short stories. So people. You know, people really like so my podcast because uh, my podcast is very sleepy. <laughs> so people, people emailed me, oh, your podcast they helped me to sleep well. <laughs> but okay, okay, but so you can be an exception, you know. So when you sleep, so <laughs> you you know will dream my so Kim Young Ha and in your dreams, so uh, you, you know. Uh, you will buy my book in the stories <laughs> or uh, in the sleeping mode. So, uh, you know, I'm kidding. Uh, 
And so I think that the reading other fiction writers' uh, the works is really good for me. So I think uh, so these days people read the novels and uh, other the literary works so fast. So, but reading in Boksuri Reading out loud, reciting. Uh, reading aloud is a very traditional way of reading in 17th centuries and uh, 16th centuries and the Middle Age and uh, other, you know, so like old old uh, Yeah, so mm -hmm. reading aloud is a very traditional way of reading and good, a really good way of reading. So we have to read the novel very slowly, very slowly and, uh, and so when I make so whenever I make uh, so every episode of the podcast, I have to read my favorite novels again and again and very slowly and slowly. So I found many interesting and intriguing things uh, so in their novels and their short stories, so which I had not so found when I so read it first. So. Uh, so I, I really want to recommend you to uh, read your favorite novels and the short stories aloud you know, again and again. So, uh. I think the wonderful thing about the podcast as well is not just the, the orations and the introduction to this great world of literature, but also the privilege of hearing a writer think deeply about these books and aspects of the books. I found it both very inspiring, but also a way of learning as well, and thinking about you know, this, these mouthful of words. Um, and uh, lastly, um, I'm, any future projects that you're willing to share with this group, or um, you know, our thoughts about how you're changing, or you see yourself changing as a writer, and uh, by default as a person? Uh, so my next project? Whatever you're willing to share. Uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, now I'm I'm finishing my uh, the sixth novel, so it will be out in this summer. The very short uh, fiction, so like uh, so maybe shorter than this. I have to write this for myself. This is very short novella. So, but my this novel. Uh, what I'm working on, that I'm working on, is very short and the uh, novel is about the serial killer. Serial killer. So, yeah. so uh, yeah, you can expect, uh, yes, that I, yeah, I sometimes adopt the very genre, genre things. Elements of, genre. Uh, genre, yeah, elements of genre novels, so uh, as I did in the Yuri Paul is calling you, or you know, I have to write this for myself. But you know, I, you know, adapt the elements of genre novels. But I, you know, the massaging, the massaging in other ways. So yeah, I really like this novel. So I, I fell in love. So these are uh, my six novels. So you will, you can read the novel in this summer. Yeah. Sounds like yeah. it'll be a very busy summer for you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, it will be your turn. It's showing. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, we're gonna take.